He is one of three generations of McMahons. In Madison Square Garden this Monday. And here's the man to tell you all about it. Here's Vince McMahon. Welcome to WrestleMania! There's a huge philosophical difference between being in strictly the wrestling business and being in the sports entertainment business as we are. I mean, Vince is... He's it. He makes you or breaks you. If I saw something like that, I'd call the authorities. That's what you would do. As the times have changed, so have we. I own WCW. Our women are extremely strong. But I had someone higher up tell me what you need to do is you need to wear a low cut top so your breasts are out and say, Vince, you know, what can I do for you? What? And I said, uh-uh. Vince McMahon, the CEO who transformed pro wrestling into a global powerhouse, now faces a hush money scandal. $12 million to four different women over a 16-year period, according to the Wall Street Journal. The deals were made to suppress allegations of sexual misconduct, and all four women were formerly affiliated with the company. Welcome, everyone. And that we obviously remain focused coming year of 2022 as well as years to come. Twenty twenty two started for WWE and Visic Man with his company reporting record revenue and record profit for the just ended year of twenty twenty one. For the first time, WWE recorded more than one billion dollars in annual revenue. Vince has also been appearing on TV more frequently. Memorably, he appeared on Survivor Series near the end of twenty twenty one showing off Cleopatra's egg to promote a new movie starring Dwayne Johnson. His participation in WWE's earnings calls diminished, but his appearances on screen increased to more than it had in a number of years as he appeared as an on-screen mentor to Austin Theory. Leading up to WrestleMania, he appeared on Pat McAfee's program and had his first video sit-down interview of notable length perhaps since the WWE Network interview that he did with Steve Austin in 2014. In that conversation, he briefly touched on Succession, no, not the television program, but the unthinkable concept of someone else leading WWE someday. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a buzz in the air that is palpable. March 3rd, 2022. Joining us live in Indianapolis, Indiana, in studio for the first time in 15 years, Vincent. Kennedy McMahon! At what point did the future of the WWE be brought to you and were you not happy about that, like when it happened? Because then there's a conversation about it maybe not being yours afterwards. Like, did, did, was that something that ever cracked into your world? Because it is a topic of conversation outside sure, of the WWE very loudly. Right. When do you think that started, and were you pissed that that conversation even happened, and is that something you even think about? No, I, I, I don't think about it a lot. Um, hopefully, you, if you built something, hopefully you want it to continue on you know, and prosper and grow, whether that's with a family member or without a family member. Because my view is the business is, is best for everybody, you know, and whether you're a part of it or you're not a part of it. And you have to treat it as such. You have to be objective you know, and look at family members, whoever it is, just like you would other employees, and quite frankly, I probably have expected more, you know, out of my family members, which is probably not the right thing. Either. <laughs> but um, but we really that's going to be a big deal right there. What you just said, you know that though. But, but nonetheless, it's like um, you have to do the right thing for the business. So if this person is not working out, then they shouldn't be a part of the company. Vince McMahon's son Shane McMahon, once thought to be the heir to the McMahon Empire, left the company in 2009. In this interview from 2016, after he had returned as a performer only, he comments on why he left WWE as an executive. I think with any parent and uh, sibling, or I should say parent and, uh, and child relationship, it's, you know, it's tough, especially with the older guard, allowing the new guard to 
flesh those ideas out and try them and go for it because they're so guarded against it. Was he not open enough to your ideas? No. Um, and, and what grew out of that was, I mean, you're asking me the real, you know, the, the reason that yeah, I left the Yeah, company. if you had to sum up the reason you left. Um, it became, it, it stopped being a collaboration and it stopped being fun. And when that happened, you know, the WWE defines my father. Right. Um, and I wasn't going to allow a deteriorating business relationship to affect our personal lives. And that's exactly what was happening. A report from Fightful said that following Royal Rumble in late January, Vince McMahon himself made the decision to part ways professionally with Shane McMahon after Shane reportedly tried to make changes to the Royal Rumble match. Before suffering his heart issue in 2021, Paul Levesque Triple H, Vince's son-in-law, and an executive vice president with the company overseeing the NXT brand, many believe had his power diminished after a faithful visit to the WWE Performance Center by Vince McMahon and WWE President and Chief Revenue Officer Nick Khan. Not long after, many of Paul Levesque's closest associates in the company, including William Regal, Gabe Sapolsky, Brian James, saw their employment with WWE, at least for the time being, come to an end. John Laurinaitis, who had previously been head of talent relations, was reinstalled in that role, taking over many of Levesque's duties. Then in May of 2022, not long after a recent earnings call, network upfronts, and on the day of WB's annual shareholders meeting. That afternoon, Vince's daughter, Stephanie McMahon, and the chief brand officer of WWE on social media announced, without advance warning to talent or staff, As of tomorrow, I'm taking a leave of absence from the majority of my responsibilities at WWE, WWE is a lifelong legacy for me, and I look forward to returning to the company that I love after taking this time to focus on my family. Outlets, including WrestleNomics, reported that she was remaining a member of WWE's board of directors and that most of her day-to-day -day duties with the company were being taken over by WWE President Nick Khan. About two weeks later, June 3rd, Business Insider reports that Stephanie McMahon, who is a popular executive responsible for advertising and sponsorships, is being replaced in her corporate role as part of a shakeup by her father, Vince McMahon. Within less than one year, wrestling fans saw reports that Vince was on the outs with his son-in-law, Paul Vec, his son, Shane McMahon, and now his daughter, Stephanie. Meanwhile, Nick Khan, who joined the company in 2020 after helping WWE secure record deals for Raw and SmackDown, seemed to be consolidating power. Are any of these events surrounding the family members connected in some way? It's still not clear. Was Vince protecting himself from threats to his power? At age 76, he'd been the most powerful person in wrestling for decades. And with the reputation of being a tireless worker who never sleeps, many believe that he would stay at the job at WWE for as long as he was able which makes what happened next all the more dramatic. June 15th, 2022, 3.52 p.m. Eastern. The Wall Street Journal publishes a story. The byline is Joe Palazzolo and Ted Mann. Headline, WWE board probes secret $3 million hush pact by CEO Vince McMahon, sources say company says relationship was consensual and is cooperating with the inquiry. Ted Mann is the second voice you hear, this from the Journal podcast, talking about the story. Vince McMahon has helped build WWE into an international success, but now his personal life has gotten in the way of how he runs the organization. In March, WWE's board of directors started to receive some emails that alleged McMahon had an affair with a former employee. According to one of the emails, he hired the woman as a paralegal and paid her $100,000 a year. But after McMahon began a sexual relationship with her, he doubled her salary. And at some point, she had decided to leave. And according to what was in these emails and what we later confirmed to be true, Vince McMahon's personal attorney negotiated an agreement with people representing this paralegal. The agreement was to pay her $3 million with a million dollars up front and the rest paid out over five years in exchange for a non-disclosure agreement and a non-disparagement agreement, essentially buying her silence about everything that had gone on. 
The emails were sent anonymously by someone claiming to be a friend of the employee. A WWE spokesman said the relationship was consensual and that the woman hasn't alleged harassment. In a letter, McMahon's lawyer said the company did not pay the settlement. And what do we know about this paralegal? We know that she was someone who who told her colleagues and others that she had fallen on hard times before she arrived at the company and that her career had been somewhat derailed by having to care for a parent who was sick. And that when she was hired, she was hired into the legal department. And then in 2021, she was moved to become an, an assistant to John Laurinaitis, who was the head of talent. Laurinaitis is also named in those emails sent to the board, which describe how McMahon gave the paralegal to Laurinaitis, quote, like a toy. You've seen these emails. Can you describe a little bit more about what they say? They really portray this relationship as one in which she was victimized, that she was a person to some degree in crisis. They don't allege harassment, but they describe a relationship, again, in the emailer's point of view, where Vince McMahon was taking advantage of an employee who you know, had other problems. We get the impression that they take it very seriously. And that certainly we're in an environment where the members of the board who have day jobs elsewhere, who are on other boards, are all operating in an environment where this is not the sort of thing you can just kind of wink at and ignore anymore. The WWE board began investigating the allegations in April. And when it did, it discovered that other female employees at WWE had also signed non-disclosure agreements involving McMahon and Laurinaitis. Vince's lawyer, Jerry McDivitt, stresses that Vince used personal money for the payments related to the NDAs, not WWE money. But does it matter? How would WWE respond to the story? Two days go by, and then they issue a press release. June 17th, 2022. Dateline Stanford, Connecticut. WWE and its board of directors jointly released the following statement today. Independent directors continue review of alleged executive misconduct. Stephanie McMahon named interim CEO and interim chairwoman. WWE and the board of directors today announced that a special committee of the board is conducting an investigation into alleged misconduct by its chairman and CEO, Vincent McMahon, and John Laurinaitis, head of talent relations, and that, effective immediately, McMahon has voluntarily stepped back from his responsibilities as CEO and chairman of the board until the conclusion of the investigation. McMahon will retain his role and responsibilities related to WWE's creative content during this period and remains committed to cooperating with the review underway. The special committee has appointed Stephanie McMahon to serve as interim CEO and interim chairwoman. I have pledged my complete cooperation to the investigation by the special committee, and I will do everything possible to support the investigation. I have also pledged to accept the findings and outcome of the investigation whatever they are, said Mr. McMahon. I love this company and am committed to working with the independent directors to strengthen our culture and our company. It is extremely important to me that we have a safe and collaborative workspace. I have committed to doing everything in my power to help the special committee complete its work, including marshalling the cooperation of the entire company to assist in the completion of the investigation and to implement its findings, said Ms. McMahon. WWE and its board of directors take all allegations of misconduct very seriously. The independent directors of the board engage independent legal counsel to assist them with an independent review. In addition, the special committee and WWE will work with an independent third party to conduct a comprehensive review of the company's compliance program, HR function, and overall culture. The company and the board do not expect to have further comment until the investigation is concluded. Here's Ted Mann on the Journal podcast talking about whether or not he was surprised that Fitzek Mann stepped down on an interim basis. I was surprised by it only because it was Vince McMahon and only because it was WWE, where so much of the company's history has been defying norms and saying that they wouldn't go along with the way other people wanted them to act and usually having that work out. Had it been any other company, I would have expected that person to be out on the street within hours. But this is Vince McMahon's company. And frankly, I paid close attention to the language. They said he was stepping aside while the inquiry is ongoing. Um, It didn't seem to me like he had disappeared into the sunset. 
So it's still Friday. That press release announcing that Vince was out on an interim basis, Stephanie McMahon taking over on an interim basis, WWE says they'll have no more comment on this until the investigation is complete. But then there's another press release two hours later. The statement is one sentence long. Mr. McMahon will appear on SmackDown tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, live on Fox. Until then, throughout Friday, mainstream media covers the news that Vince McMahon has stepped down. There is less focus on the fact that Vince is remaining in his position as head of creative. Here is part of a segment on CNN that day with Jake Tapper and Jason Carroll reporting. And Jake, the WWE is out with a statement of their own saying that the board has retained an independent legal counsel to assist with what they call an independent review of the allegations. As for McMahon, he is staying in front of the cameras. He's expected to be on SmackDown later on tonight. Jake? Of course he is. Jason Carroll, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Then finally, Vince appeared on SmackDown in the first segment of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. McMahon! It is a privilege, as always, to stand before you here tonight, the WWE Universe. Especially a privilege to stand here in this ring in Minnesota. I'm here simply to remind you of the four words we just saw and the, what we call the WWE signature. Those four words are then, now, forever, and the most important word is together. Welcome to SmackDown! And that was it. That was his whole statement. When the ratings came out, it was one of the most highly viewed episodes of SmackDown in years. But Vince wasn't done yet. Unadvertised. Unannounced. He appeared on Raw on Monday. Wait a minute, guys! Oh my gosh! Tonight marks the 1,517th edition of Monday Night Raw. Which makes it, well, it continues to make it the longest running episodic television show in history. And for that, I say thank you. Raw's been on the air for almost 30 years. 20 of those 30 years has been dominated by the greatest WWE superstar of all time. And that man makes his return to Raw live here next week. I make reference to no, no, no less than Mr. Hustle, loyalty and respect, John Cena! Not only was the SmackDown rating way up, but the Raw rating. Despite Vince not being advertised to appear, the Raw rating was up strongly too. The best rating for that program since the one after WrestleMania. On WWE's following earnings call, Stephanie McMahon described her decision to end her leave of absence and come back as interim CEO and chairwoman. Um, I've worked my entire life for this business. I love this business. I took a leave of absence realizing um, that I, I needed a little bit of time with my family given the, the grueling schedule and nature. Um, I got about three weeks, which is more than, than a lot of other folks get. Um, and I was not forced into returning um, as the, the CEO and chairman in the interim position I offered. Um, that was an, an opportunity for me to come back and be a part of this company that I love and have the opportunity to lead this company. Stephanie's husband, Paul Levesque, in an interview, describes the decision somewhat differently in this interview with BT Sport. There's this moment in time where she's like, all right, I'm gonna take a breath. I need to step away for a little bit. I'm gonna take a little bit of time off. Vince is like, great, yeah, you need to t take some time, take a breath, all that stuff. Doesn't know what it's gonna be, doesn't know what she's gonna do, but just needs that time. Spend it with me, spend it with the kids, spend it with the family. We're like three weeks in <laughs> to this, as this process is unfolding, the, 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 
the drama of it all and we're at one point we're 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 like three weeks in we're going to go up to our lake house and relax and she's like ready to go up there this is like the beginning of the like the full-on take a break right and uh, we're literally in the car driving up there mm-hmm. and we get the phone call that says we need you to step in would, would you step in as chairwoman and ceo in the now and she's like <laughs> can i call you back in a little bit and think about this for a minute and we spend the rest of the drive driving up there and like there was a time limit on that like yeah no we need to know now wow and uh yeah we spend the rest of the drive up there going like what what do we do here and it's in a way sort of like you can't it's your life's work or passion or family legacy all those things right and 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 in as much as anybody else is what she loves and is like yeah i'm in the following monday june 27th an article in New York Magazine by Abraham Reisman, the author of an upcoming biography about Vince McMahon, publishes an article with comments from Rita Chatterton, who in 1992 accused Vince McMahon of raping her in a limousine when Chatterton worked for McMahon as a referee in 1986. Here's Rita Chatterton in 1992 on Geraldo Rivera's program describing the incident. Vince's driver got out and opened the door and I thought Vince was gonna get out. But instead, Vince said to me, no, Rita, come in here. He says, we just sat in a diner for a couple hours. I really don't want coffee. He says, we'll just sit and talk here. We're sitting in a parking lot. I mean, it, I didn't think much of it. I got in the limo with him. We got into the limo. Vince started talking about magazines, uh, T-shirts, wrestling dolls. We don't have, don't have a, fe- uh, a referee doll at this point. A female would be great. On and on and on. Again, starts talking about a half a million dollar a year contract. Next thing I know, Vince McMahon is unzipping his pants. I was pretty shocked at that point. I, you know, I mean, we're talking profession here, and and suddenly he wants more than just profession. Vince continued to, you know, if you want a half a million dollar contract, you're going to have to satisfy me, and this is the way things have to go. Vince grabbed my hand, kept trying to put my hand on him. Um, I was scared. My wrist. At the end, my wrist was all purple, black and black and blue. Things just didn't, he just, God, he just didn't stop. This man just didn't stop, you know, a half a million dollar a year contract. How's your daughter going to go to college? Of course, she doesn't have to go to college. I left a $30,000 a year job on Vince McMahon's word. He knew that. What is your allegation, Rita? State it. My allegation right now is sexual harassment. I was forced into oral sex with Vince McMahon when I couldn't complete his desires. He got really angry, started ripping off my my jeans, pulled me on top of him and told me again, if I wanted a half a million dollar a year contract, I had to satisfy him. He could make me or break me. And if I didn't satisfy him, I was blackballed. That was it. I was done. The article also publishes an interview with Mario Mancini, who says Chatterton told him about the assault the day after she alleges it took place. You know, the day after it happened, I walked into an arena. And Rita was in the arena, leaning against the the, uh, ring apron. And I walked up with her to her with a smile, ready to give her that brotherly hug, you know, and she just burst out in tears. And I said, well, what happened? Well, I got into Vince's limo last night. I went, oh, okay. And, you know, he took his gimmick out and, um, forced my head down there and um i I really wasn't thrilled with that and he kind of pulled me on top pulled me on top of him i guess she had a dress on and they did what they did i said i told you to stay away from everybody (laughs) i told you to stay away from him you know i said you're 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 done done gonna get rid of you. You, you you know i i was scared I was frightened. What was I going to do? I didn't know what to do. I was so, 
I was I, at the same time I was sick to my stomach and and it was only a matter of time that they got rid of her. That clip from the Cheap Heat podcast. July 3rd, after WWE's Money in the Bank event in Las Vegas, the McMahons went down the street and sat in the audience for the UFC 276 event, also in Las Vegas. They were shown on screen, with Vince sitting next to Stephanie and Paul Levesque and Pat McAfee, as perhaps Vince continued to try to show that he wasn't hiding from the story. Then Thursday, July 7th, WWE publishes an SEC filing that states, On July 6th, 2022, Connor Shell resigned from the board of directors of World Wrestling Entertainment Inc., effective immediately. Mr. Shell resigned from the board due to an increased slate of responsibilities resulting from his new expanded role at the newly formed The North Road Company, a global multi genre content studio. Mr. Shell's decision to resign from the board was not due to any dispute or disagreement with the company, its management, or the board on any matter relating to the company's operations, policies, or practices. Shell's associate, Peter Chernin, the chairman and CEO of the Chernin Group, did announce on July 6th that he would be rolling up content studios, Chernin Entertainment, and Red Arrow into a new $1 billion venture, the North Road Company. Conspicuously, he was not the only director to leave the board before the end of the year. Barstool CEO Erica Nardini also left the board in September. The following morning, Friday, July 8th, a new article is published from the Wall Street Journal at 10.15 a.m., again from reporters Joe Palazzolo and Ted Mann, this time also in the byline Joe Flint. Vince McMahon, World Wrestling Entertainment Inc.'s longtime leader, agreed to pay more than $12 million over the past 16 years to suppress allegations of sexual misconduct and infidelity, an amount far larger than previously known. The payouts went to four women, all formerly affiliated with WWE, who signed agreements with Mr. McMahon that prohibit them from discussing potential legal claims against or their relationships with the 76-year-old executive, according to people familiar with the deals as well as documents reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. The previously unreported settlements include a $7.5 million pact with a former wrestler who alleged that Mr. McMahon coerced her into giving him oral sex and then demoted her and ultimately declined to renew her contract in 2005 after she resisted further sexual encounters. The wrestler and her attorney approached Mr. McMahon in 2018 and negotiated the payment in return for her silence. In another previously unreported deal, a WWE contractor presented the company with solicited nude photos of Mr. McMahon she reported receiving from him and alleged that he had sexually harassed her on the job. Mr. McMahon agreed to pay her roughly $1 million, and in a 2006 agreement, a former manager who had worked 10 years for Mr. McMahon before he allegedly initiated a sexual relationship with her was paid $1 million to keep quiet about it. The board is also investigating allegations that WWE executive John Laurinaitis had a sexual relationship with the same former paralegal. Additionally, the board is looking at a $1.5 million non-disclosure agreement reached in 2012 with an employee involving misconduct claims against Mr. Laurinaitis. Mr. Laurinaitis, a former wrestler known as Johnny Ace, had been head of WWE talent relations for eight years when he was forced to step down in 2012 and take a smaller role at the company. His demotion came around the same time as the $1.5 million deal with the employee, who alleged she had an affair with Mr. Laurinaitis and that he demoted her after she broke it off. Mr. McMahon had restored Mr. Laurinaitis as head of talent relations last year. WWE has since placed Mr. Laurinaitis on administrative leave. In a June 8th letter to the journal, Mr. McMahon's attorney, Jerry McDivitt, said that the former paralegal hadn't made any claims of harassment against Mr. McMahon and that WWE did not pay any monies to the ex-employee on her departure. In 2006, Mr. McMahon made news after an employee at a Boca Raton, Florida tanning salon accused him of groping her, according to a police report. The employee told police that Mr. McMahon showed her nude photos of himself on his phone and later tried to kiss her, the police report said. Mr. McMahon said he was only trying to have a little fun, according to the woman's account in the police report. Mr. McMahon's lawyers told police he denied any wrongdoing. Prosecutors declined to file charges, citing a lack of independent evidence. The former paralegal to whom Mr. McMahon agreed to pay $3 million was brought into the company as a legal assistant in 2019. She never applied for the job. Mr. McMahon had met her at his Stamford, Connecticut condo building, where both were living. WWE placed her in the legal department because the woman's resume said she had attended law school. The woman often talked with colleagues in the department about her close relationship with Mr. McMahon. 
The talk about Mr. McMahon was so frequent that her boss asked her to stop, saying she was making other employees uncomfortable, according to one of the people. In 2021, the woman transferred from the legal department to talent relations under Mr. Laurinaitis, who returned to the role he had a decade earlier. WWE considered raising the woman's salary from $100,000 to around $300,000 at Mr. McMahon's request. The company settled on a base salary of $200,000 and a director-level position. An anonymous email sent to the board on March 30th this year and viewed by the journal alleged that Mr. McMahon increased the woman's salary after he began a sexual relationship with her. The email alleged that Mr. McMahon, quote, gave her like a toy, end quote, to Mr. Laurinaitis. A few days after the second article from the Wall Street Journal, reporters Ted Mann and Joe Palazzolo joined Busted Open Radio to talk about the story. The first voice you'll hear is Joe Palazzolo, followed by Ted Mann. These are situations, even if the company is saying it's consensual, and especially you're talking about the first story, mm -hmm. this person's livelihood is depending on remaining in the good graces of you know, her boss, right? Um, and so... The, the risk that you run uh, with this is that with this power imbalance is that maybe someone is doing something that they don't want to do, um, but they want to keep their job. And then on top of that, it's not it's happening at the tippy top of the company. This is happening with your, your chief executive and the relationship was well known within the company. And so they see that going on. And, you know, like, you know, corporate muckety mucks are always talking about tone from the top, but it is like it's a real thing. Right. And so if you're seeing your chief executive is not only sort of permitting this kind of conduct, but engaging and sort of leading the way in it. I mean, that's a problem all the way down. When, as we were reporting out what settlements agree, settlement agreements were existent, the fact that there was one that was for seven and a half million dollars was fairly eye popping. That's a figure that, you know, in, in sort of murky world of NDAs clearly suggests a big secret um, being kept. Um, and that was that was one of the red flags that signaled to us that, that we had to get to the bottom of what that was, what it was for. The story surrounding Vince and WWE is getting some mainstream media coverage, but not as much as maybe one would expect. Still on Busted Open, Ted Mann comments on that subject. I think that's a really excellent question. And I think it's linked to something that we heard a lot um, or I guess I saw a lot like on Twitter after the first story, th there were a lot of reactions saying like, oh, well, what do you expect? Um, or people sort of saying, well, look at the character he plays. The character he plays is essentially the same guy that the, this reporting depicts behind the scenes. And there was this sense of amongst, again, not everybody, but some people that like this shouldn't be so much of a surprise because, you know, they say they're wild and crazy. That's the whole brand. And they say that they're sort of flouting norms and conventions. That's the whole personality. But um, but yeah, no, I think it's I think it's a really good question why why this wouldn't maybe has not broken through as much as it would if this if we were writing about yeah I think an NFL owner is a good example. Previously on WrestleNomics, we've espoused what we call the Snickers doctrine, the notion that WWE generally does not respond to fan backlash, but what they will respond to is business partner disapproval. The Snickers doctrine established in 2018 after fan discontent that WWE named a battle royal after the fabulous moolah, bringing to light years of allegations of abuse. WWE did not change the name of the battle royal in the face of fan feedback, but did only after the Mars Company, which is the owner of Snickers, which was the title sponsor for that year's WrestleMania, issued a statement acknowledging the issue surrounding the name of the battle royal. And actually, in this case, while many fans voiced their disapproval about the allegations surrounding Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis, TV ratings, at least in the short term, actually increased. By mid-July, one month passed since the first Wall Street Journal story broke, Vince McMahon is still in control of creative and has only stepped back on an interim basis. Many wondered when or if WWE's powerful business partners would exude their influence. Certainly, uh, yeah, certainly I, I think that the owners of those platforms, especially the big public ones like Disney, have their own, they have staked out their own sort of position on how this sort of thing would be handled within their company. And I think one of the realities of capitalism is if you're, you have a business partner who's doing something that you would say is inappropriate, you're going to expect to get a question or two from a shareholder, from a reporter. Um, so I'm sure this, that that's something that they're considering. Here's a segment from CNN with comments from Business Insider reporter Claire Atkinson. Yeah, you'd have to wonder whether all of the WWE partners, whether it's Disney, whether it's Peacock, whether it's Fox, uh, and Netflix also had a, a biopic of Vince in the works, which I read is now cancelled. Like, what are they thinking? Are they thinking that this is just going to go away? There were, mm. you know, the Wall Street Journal is already on its second story about 
uh, Vince McMahon coercing a colleague into sex and then having to uh, pay another uh, couple of million dollars um, to the lady and then she exited. Um, I think, you know, the question is, d does anybody care? This is a brand that operates in the wrestling ring. Oh gosh, that's cynical. It's all about bad behavior, this right? Is this is a Me Too story. In 2017, this, this would have been breaking news headlines. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So the yeah. silence is pretty deafening. Hmm. Um, you also got to wonder, like, what exactly is this investigation that the board is doing? The board is made up of Vince McMahon's daughter, Stephanie McMahon, hmm. her husband, and also Erica Nardini, who's the CEO of Barstool Sports. Hmm. So. You kind of wonder like where this is really going. Stephanie was yucking it up at the oh, UFC okay. last so weekend you're, with you're, her dad. Gotta, I appreciate the cynical. You're being a realist, not a cynical, but you're being a realist. I'm Let asking me. the questions. That clip was from reliable sources on July 10th. About a week later, Monday night, July 18th, Titus O'Neil opens up Monday Night Raw, apropos of nothing, talking about his role as WWE brand ambassador. You see, I get a chance to represent WWE all over the world in something that I feel that we need now more than ever all over the world, which is good will. And there is no question that each and every one of us do everything we can to put smiles on all of your faces, both inside and outside of the ring, whether it's helping those less fortunate, or supporting our servicemen and women all over the globe. We also support causes that help promote family, health, and community. All these things that help bring people together to do good. So that's what we get a chance to do, go all over and spread goodness and goodwill. That's why you'll never hear us talk about politics or religion or any other subject matter that's divisive. Because regardless of your race, your economic status, or your nationality, this is a place that we deserve to have a safe haven. This is a place that WWE wants to simply make sure that we all have a good time. Then Friday morning, July 22nd, WWE sends out a press release with the headline, Paul Levesque is back. The statement is only two sentences long. It reads, WWE today announced that effective immediately, Paul Levesque will resume his executive position as EVP Talent Relations. I look forward to returning to my prior position as Head of Talent Relations. I'm healthy, fired up, and ready to take charge, said Levesque. It's not clear what exactly this changed for Paul Levesque in terms of his duties. His previous title was Executive Vice President, Global Talent, Strategy, and Development. Apparently, though, this press release signaled that Levesque was taking over John Laurinaitis' duties as he was out on administrative leave. Then, just after the close of the market, on the same day, 4.05 p.m., Vince McMahon tweets, At 77, time for me to retire. Thank you, WWE Universe. Then, now, forever, together. A press release is published two minutes later with further comments. As I approach 77 years old, I feel it's time for me to retire as chairman and CEO of WWE. Throughout the years, it's been a privilege to help WWE bring you joy, inspire you, thrill you, surprise you, and always entertain you. I would like to thank my family for mightily contributing to our success, and I would also like to thank all of our past and present superstars and employees for their dedication and passion to our brand. Most importantly, I would like to thank our fans for allowing us into your homes every week 
and being your choice of entertainment. I hold the deepest appreciation and admiration for our generations of fans all over the world who have liked, currently like, and sometimes even love our form of sports entertainment. Our global audience can take comfort in knowing WWE will continue to entertain you with the same fervor, dedication, and passion as always. I'm extremely confident in the continued success of WWE, and I leave our company in the capable hands of an extraordinary group of superstars, employees, and executives. In particular, both Chairwoman and Co-CEO Stephanie McMahon and Co-CEO Nick Khan. As majority shareholder, I will continue to support WWE in any way I can. My personal thanks to our community of business partners, shareholders, and board of directors for their guidance and support through the years. Then, now, forever, together. And like that, the career of the most powerful man in the history of pro wrestling was finished, apparently. In WWE, where employees don't have a pension plan, Retiring is effectively the same thing as resigning. By Monday, it would be announced that Paul Levesque was the new head of creative, and Vince was truly out. What were the forces that led Vince to actually step down, a man who has a reputation of never backing down in the face of controversy, of trying to ignore the problem and continue forward? According to a report in the Wall Street Journal months later, Vince regretted stepping down and felt he was given bad advice. Did business partners like NBC Universal and Fox apply pressure? Stephanie later commented, at a media conference that the news surrounding Vince did cause a problem for advertisers. On, mm -hmm. ...on sponsorship and how we can integrate partners into our programming and the different mm -hmm. opportunities and all the white space that exists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing positive momentum. And again, like, like I've said on the calls, we did have a pause. Yeah. Um, and, and in addition to the macro headwinds, you know, of course, there, there was some, some change in things that happened in our yeah. company this year. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we're definitely seeing for next year what we wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So we remain bullish in terms of our opportunities there. What kind of takes you past the pause into that bullish opportunity? What, what we already are. I, yeah. I think um, mm -hmm. for, for some companies, it was just a holding period. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let's yeah. wait and see what happens. You right. know? Um, it, believe it or not, some companies are risk averse. Or was Vince urged to resign by his family members or by executives close to him like Nick Khan? some of whom saw their power increase after Vince was out of the way. The Journal also reported that Vince and WWE were facing regulatory scrutiny. More on that in a moment. The news broke before Friday Night Smackdown later that evening in Minneapolis. After hearing the news, Brock Lesnar reportedly left the building, although he was convinced later to come back. Stephanie McMahon, now the new co-CEO and chairwoman of WWE, who only two months earlier suddenly took a leave of absence, opened Smackdown live in the ring. Earlier tonight, my father, Vince McMahon, retired from WWE. This is the, the company that he created, that he founded, and he wanted to make sure in his retirement that he thanked all of you. He thanked the WWE universe. <laughs> and that's all of you out here, that's everybody in the back, that is all of our crew, that, that's everyone who hangs the rigging, it's everyone who designs all of the graphics, it's even Pat McAfee and I guess Michael Cole. <laughs> this is the WWE Universe and we are eternally grateful for all of you. But since Vince had the opportunity to thank us, I think this is the moment that we take to thank him. So now we're gonna do it together, right? Thank you, Vince. Thank you, Vince. As you can hear, fans cheered on Vince McMahon and thanked him despite his abrupt resignation following a number of sexual misconduct allegations. On Monday morning, Paul of Exposition as head of creative was made official, as well as the new CEO titles for Stephanie McMahon and Nick Khan. Also around this time, John Laurinaitis was quietly fired. An SEC filing was made public. It reads, 
The company has made a preliminary determination that certain payments that Vince McMahon agreed to make during the period from 2006 through 2022, including amounts paid and payable in the future, and that were not recorded in WWE's consolidated financial statements, should have been recorded as expenses in the quarters in which those agreements were made. Even though Vince, yes, may have used personal money to pay women for non-disclosure agreements, it's still a problem for the company because those payments benefited WWE. They were made to not only protect Vince McMahon personally, but were made to protect the company. And that's not an argument that we're making here. That was WWE's board's own conclusion. Those expenses that totaled more than $14 million grew even larger as WWE disclosed that there was an additional $5 million that should have been counted as expenses related to payments Vince McMahon personally made in 2007 and 2009, two payments that total $5 million. WrestleNomics pointed out that in 2007 and 2009, you can find in public IRS filings for the Trump Foundation that Vince McMahon and WWE gave the Trump Foundation $4 million and $1 million, totaling $5 million in those years. 2007 and 2009 are the years that Trump appeared on WWE programming in 2007 at WrestleMania, in 2009 in the angle where he buys Raw and sells it back to Vince at a profit. So yes, to top it all off, there was a Trump angle to this. It seems that Donald Trump was largely compensated for his appearances at WWE events in donations by WWE to the foundation, which were not properly recorded as expenses by the company. Again, perhaps Vince's personal money was used for this, but really it doesn't matter because those appearances by Trump on WWE programming clearly benefited WWE. WWE doesn't explicitly disclose that the payments are related to payments to the Trump Foundation. However, it would be highly coincidental if it was for anything else. Less than a week after we pointed out the coincidence, the Wall Street Journal confirmed that WWE's board found that the $5 million was related to payments made by Vince McMahon to the Trump Foundation. Because WWE is a publicly traded company, and it had been revealed that the company did not account for a number of expenses that it should have accounted for, the Securities and Exchanges Commission and federal prosecutors launched inquiries into those unrecorded payments, according to the Wall Street Journal's reporting. In WWE's own disclosures, the company noted that it had received regulatory, investigative, and enforcement inquiries, subpoenas, or demands related to these previously unrecorded NDA payments in exchange for the silence of multiple women and the previously unrecorded donations to the Trump Foundation in exchange for Donald Trump's performances. This might have been something that Vince could have gotten away with if WWE was still a private company, wholly owned by him and his family, but World Wrestling Entertainment being a publicly traded company, even though $19 million spread over the course of 15 years is not material on WWE's large scale. That is to say, $19 million is a lot of money to you and me, but not a lot of money to WWE over the course of 15 years. Still. Having a public share price with public financial statements where investors and potential investors are supposed to be able to look at your financial statements and rely on them as accurate so they can assess the value of your company appropriately makes $19 million worth of unrecorded expenses especially problematic, besides the obvious problem with sexual misconduct. Before the year was over, the Wall Street Journal came out with one more article on the story. It revealed that Rita Chatterton is looking for an $11.75 million settlement related to her allegation that Vince McMahon raped her in 1986. Additionally, the journal reports a new allegation. A woman who's a manager at a California spa in 2011 accuses Vince of sexual assault. That brings the number of women who we know of who have accused Vince McMahon of sexual misconduct to seven. For many years in WWE's SEC filings, the company warned investors that the loss of services of Vince McMahon could hurt the business. Vince, who is so instrumental in creating storylines and characters that are important to WWE, if he's not around, business could be adversely affected. For the first time in 2022, that was put to the test. And so far, near the end of the year, about five months since Vince has been gone, TV ratings are either stable or up. For attendance, while non-televised house shows continue to slide, Ticket sales for TV tapings Raw and SmackDown are on the rise. The company goes into next year's TV rights negotiations, which will be key for the financial future of the company, looking pretty strong. Consumer interest seems stable, possibly growing, and particularly for the latter, the same can't be said for the last few years of Vince's run as head of creative, where multiple consumer metrics 
including ticket sales, TV ratings, and merchandise sales, declined in consecutive years between 2016 and 2019. Meanwhile, the shows were widely panned. In the short term since Vince left the company, WWE's stock price continued to grow as Wall Street speculated that the company might be sold now that Vince was no longer in charge. So the company seems to be doing fine, business-wise. But what really changed about WWE since Vince resigned, since John Laurinaitis was fired? WWE's board of directors never made the results of their investigation public. Executives have said little but glowing comments about Vince since his exit. Did any of the current executives know about the sexual misconduct allegations against Vince before the public knew about them? And for how long? Have there been changes to WWE's policies since he left? What changes has WWE put in place to assure employees, talent, and business partners that there won't be similar misconduct in the future? These are questions that WWE has not answered yet, and it's not clear when or if they ever will.